you know, well, today we're really fortunate to have uh, Jason McLaren here um, to give us our talk. He got his bachelor's degree from Wayne State and then went on to do a PhD in the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins. Uh, after that, he did postdoctoral work at NIH in the Vaccine Research Center with uh, Peter Kwong and working with Barney Graham. Uh, in 2013, he moved to Dartmouth to start his own lab. And then in 2018, he moved to the University of Texas at Austin, where he's in the molecular biosciences. Uh, his research focuses on molecular mechanisms of host pathogen interactions. And I'm sure that's what he's going to talk about today. Some of his early work on that uh, focused on structure-based design of vaccines, trying to understand the properties of viral structures. Uh, and for that work, they were listed by Science Magazine as one of the top breakthroughs of 2013. Those of you that know things about medicine and molecular biology will probably recognize the winner from that year, which was cancer immunotherapy. And the CRISPR-Cas9 system was also one of the runner-ups. And so that shows even early on that his work was recognized as having a big impact. Uh, one of the papers that really stands out to me, which I don't, again, I don't wanna take away too much from his talk today, was from a paper that was published in PNAS in 2017, where they um, published a new strategy for stabilizing uh, viral antigens and made a statement toward the end of the paper saying that that strategy would likely be important for emerging coronaviruses. Uh, and that's exactly the strategy that was used by all of the vaccines that are available in the United States today. And so if you've been vaccinated against COVID-19, you have Jason to thank for part of why they work so well. And that uh, work of his is um, something that everybody that's been vaccinated has gotten into their body. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of us as scientists think about having an impact on, on people's lives and things like that. But I think right now, Jason is one of the ones uh, that's really had, you know, as big an impact as you can imagine in this pandemic and ending it. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll let Jason tell us about his work. Great. Uh, Carlos, thank you so much. That was a fantastic introduction. I'm actually going to talk about most of what you what you discussed, uh, even dating all the way back to, to some of my uh, postdoctoral work, just to kind of show the the arc of structure based vaccine design and how it's uh, we, we hope has had an impact on human health. Uh, I do have conflicts of interest though, and have to show these. So I am an inventor on patents related to prefusion RSVF and its use, as well as prefusion stabilized coronavirus spikes and their use. Um, and then also other patents related to monoclonal antibodies and camelid antibodies for, for RSV and uh, coronaviruses. So I'll start off with just like 10, 15 slides on, on pneumoviruses and my early work. Um, on respiratory syncytial virus that was primarily as, as a postdoctoral fellow and, and how that set the stage for my later work uh, in my independent lab, still working with Barney Graham on uh, coronaviruses. And so what pneumoviruses and coronaviruses, one of the things they have in common is that for entry, they both use class one viral fusion glycoproteins, right? So class one, there's class one, class two, class three, uh, but class ones are all synthesized as single chain inactive precursors. They need to be proteolytically activated. And so coronavirus S proteins are the largest ones um, in the family. And maybe it's because the, the coronavirus, uh, they have the largest RNA genomes, and then the others have had to become more efficient with the smaller genomes. So you see coronavirus S is the largest. Other well-known class one viral fusion proteins include HIV-1 envelope, which gets proteolytically activated into GP120 and GP41, influenza hemagglutinin, and then the, the F proteins from paramyxoviruses and pneumoviruses like respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and so aligned like this by their end terminus, you might not see too much uh, similarity, uh, but if you align them by one of their proteolytic cleavage sites, you can start to see a little bit more about their ancestral relationship. So Coronavirus spikes, as well as RSVF proteins, have two proteolytic cleavage sites. Um, and the S1-S2 junction in coronaviruses has received a lot of attention for SARS-CoV-2 because there's insertion of four residues, which leads to a furin site. But S1-S2 is actually not critical. Uh, the critical cleavage site is the S2 prime. That's the one that's conserved. Um, and that cleavage there liberates the fusion peptide shown in red 
which is, is then able to thrust into the target cell membrane. So the S1 subunit is essentially a fusion suppressive cap that sits on top of the fusion machinery, S2 for coronaviruses, and prevents premature rearrangement and refolding. Um, and S2 contains the fusion peptide, transmembrane domain, and two heptad repeats that will interact with each other to form a trimeric coiled coil uh, in the post-fusion state. And so you can see coronavirus, the S1, uh, that combined protein receptors, it has actually two four domains, uh, HIV-1 envelope, the GP120 components, quite a bit smaller, but it's still able to bind proteins like its receptor CD4, CCR5. HA1 is even smaller, uh, it no longer binds proteins, it binds sialic acid, and then the F proteins have completely lost the fusion suppressive cap. And we actually don't know how they trigger at the proper time and place to refold, and, and they're also really unstable. Uh, and so as a postdoc, uh, I was in Peter Kwong's lab, we were working on HIV-1 structure-based vaccine design and nothing, nothing seems to work. And so I thought, why don't we try some of these interesting approaches for a more tractable virus? Um, and Barney Graham was there, and he's a, an expert in respiratory syncytial virus. He thought RSV would be great. Uh, so RSV is a, it's a pneumovirus. Uh, they, it buds as a filament. The surface of the virus contains the, the F protein, as well as an attachment protein shown in blue. For the F protein for RSV, we know it exists initially in this pre-fusion confirmation. Um, there's some uh, it, it either spontaneously refolds or is stimulated, but it, it, whatever, if there's a stimulation, we don't know what it is. So it may just spontaneously refold. Um, and it, it goes into this pre hairpin intermediate where the fusion peptides are thrust into the host cell membrane. And so now the protein is spanning both, both the viral membrane and the host cell membrane. And then this begins to break down and form the stable post-fusion structure, which leads to fusion of the host cell membrane and the virus membrane. And then you get the fusion pore and the contents of the virus can enter the, the host cell. Um, so what we really wanted to do at starting off was to, uh, to try to use pre-fusion F as a vaccine antigen, but it was incredibly hard. Every time we made F, we got post-fusion F. Um, and and RSV has been around since 1955. I mean, that's when it was isolated um, and nobody could stabilize pre-fusion F. And so, um, Barney and I, our, our idea is that if we could find some antibodies that were specific uh, for only the pre-fusion confirmation and failed to bind post-fusion confirmation, maybe we could use those to lock F in the pre-fusion confirmation and get the structure and then figure out, based on the structure, how to rationally engineer mutations to stabilize it. Um, and we were able to do that. Uh, we worked with a group in Xiamen University, uh, Professor Ning Xiao Xia, they were able to isolate one monoclonal antibody called 5C4 from over 2,000 uh, hybridomas in mice. And, and that antibody showed very potent neutralization. And so um, more potent is, is to the left. It was about two logs more potent than this one in gray, which is called palibizumab or Synergis, which is actually used in the clinic to treat um, at-risk infants from developing severe RSV disease. So it's about two logs more potent. And most importantly, on an ELISA to post-fusion RSVF, it showed no binding, uh, whereas Synergis is actually able to bind post-fusion. And then we were able to obtain two other antibodies called AM22 and D25. These were isolated by a company called AIM Therapeutics from, a, uh, from an infected human. And these had the same properties that they were able to potently neutralize RSV, uh, prevent entry, but failed to bind post-fusion F. And so what I was able to do then was to simultaneously transfect three plasmids into 293 cells. And the plasmids encoded the F protein ectodomain, the heavy chain and the light chain of, of these antibodies. And uh, what the cells secreted then was a complex of the antibody locked uh, to the pre-fusion confirmation. Uh, that allowed me to get this 3.6 on angstrom crystal structure of um, this one antibody, D25, bound to the pre-fusion state. Uh, we had some negative stain EM that showed AM22 and 5C4 were also all binding to a similar site at the apex of pre-fusion F. So we called this antigenic site zero. 
a couple of years earlier in 2011, uh, I was able to determine the post-fusion structure. And so at this point in 2013, I guess it was like end of 2012, we now had full trimer structures of the echo domains for post-fusion RSVF and pre-fusion RSVF. And we could start to understand the conformational changes between the, these two different states. Uh, we could see that the F1 and F2 subunits are highly intertwined. So F2 is in blue, F1 is in green. So it's not like uh, it's a different protein sitting on top. It's essentially just all, all one uh, fold protein. The fusion peptide shown in red is buried inside the central cavity of the pre-fusion state, sequestered away from the solvent. Uh, we can see that it's easier if we look at a protomer. So this is just one protomer, um, the protomer in ribbons. And so you can see about half of the protein between the pre-fusion and post-fusion state is in the same conformation. So you can see this helix, loop helix. This is all in the same conformation. And so what really changes is the, the N-termini of the F1 subunit. The, the N-terminus has the hydrophobic fusion peptide, a helix turn helix, a beta hairpin, and then another helix. All of that flips 180 degrees and polymerizes into a long alpha helix in the post-fusion conformation. Even the beta hairpin in yellow and green refolds into alpha helix. And then the C-terminus of F1 flips around to form the outer helix of the six helix bundle. So it's a really dramatic uh, refolding and, and conformation for a single protein to undergo. And so now that we had those structures, I was able to go in and rationally design substitutions predicted to prevent the conformational change from occurring. And I think we got a little lucky with one of them because there was, there was two serines, serine 155 and serine 290, hydrogen bonding to each other, side chains, hydrogen bonding to each other. And what was fortunate is that one of the serines was in a region in blue that moves between pre and post fusion. And one was in a region in gray that stays the same. And so by changing those to cysteines, it formed a covalent disulfide bond that prevented the fusion peptide from releasing. And then I also designed some cavity filling substitutions that further stabilize the apex of the molecule. Um, a lot of proteins are packed very tightly and, and that helps, um, it helps with their folding and stability. These proteins actually aren't packed so tightly because they do have to undergo a conformational change. And so we can find like cavities. Uh, we were able to mutate serine to phenylalanine and it just fills this pocket that was normally there. Uh, so this allowed us to, for the first time, express and purify F protein, stabilizing the pre-fusion state. We showed it bound D25 and AM22. And then when Barney immunized mice, and in this case, rhesus macaques, and looked at the neutralizing antibody titers that were elicited by these F proteins, uh, we saw that post-fusion F elicited EC50 titers in the, in the hundreds, which is kind of what we'd always seen and, and others in the field. But now pre-fusion F was in the, the high thousands, almost 10,000, uh, almost two logs uh, higher neutralizing antibodies than, than post-fusion F. And so these were the highest titers Barney had ever seen in his career. And so we were really excited that we had created an immunogen um, based on structural information. And as Carlos mentioned, this was a, a runner up in 2013 for, for a breakthrough of the year and served as proof of principle for structure-based vaccine design. This has been continued um, uh, clinically at the more normal pace of vaccine development. So we created that antigen in 2013 and it, uh, it started phase one clinical trial in 2017. And uh, so this is with healthy adults, 18 to 50 years old. Um, they're receiving two injections 12 weeks apart with either 50, 150 or 500 micrograms per dose with and without alum. It's important to, to recognize that uh, all adults have been infected multiple times of RSV, so we aren't immunizing a naive population, so they all have uh, baseline titers at week zero. Um, but you can see that particularly the group at the 150 microgram group, after just, this is just after a single dose, we're able to boost the neutralization titers 15 fold, 12 fold. Um, so from like week zero to week four, we were seeing 15 fold, week zero to week 12 is around 10 fold. And those have now stabilized. And so after a year, they're still about 10 fold higher than where they, they, they started. And um, that's, that's been really exciting. It's, it's the highest neutralizing antibodies 
uh, increase that's been observed. Normally for all the historical vaccine candidates, um, they only elicit a three to four fold boost. And, and so we're, we're hopeful that this is enough to get us over the, the threshold. So uh, GlaxoSmithKline, they've been pushing forward the molecule that, that I designed as the postdoc. So that just entered phase three clinical trials at the end of last year. Um, kind of lost amid all the, the coronavirus um, work that was going on. Pfizer is also using something very similar to the molecule I designed, but with some additional changes to try and get around our IP, and we'll kind of see how, how that plays out. But we're really excited that we now have these prefusion uh, F antigens in pivotal phase three clinical trials, and the readout should, the interim readout should occur in 2022. Um, they're targeting two different populations. One is the maternal immunizations, trying to immunize pregnant women in the third trimester to boost the antibody titers 12, 15 fold and uh, passively transfer that to the infant to protect them during their first RSV season. Uh, and then other programs targeting the elderly uh, because RSV also leads to significant morbidity and mortality in the elderly. So that, that was all the work we had done by around 2013 on, on RSV. And I was leaving to start my own lab at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And um, around end of 2012, 2013, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus had emerged in Saudi Arabia and the surrounding regions. And Barney and I were thinking like, this would be a great target to try to uh, apply everything we had just learned from RSV and structure-based vaccine design and try and figure out how to make an optimal coronavirus uh, vaccine antigen. So the, it, as I've talked about, the coronavirus spike is similar to RSVF, except it has this fusion suppressive S1 subunit uh, that's involved in receptor binding. And so uh, the virus is up here, the S1 subunit is kind of at, the, at the, the apex here of the protein. And so it contains these receptor binding domains that can go up and down and either hide or expose the receptor binding site. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 binds to, to ACE2 on the surface of our cells. So we can see one RBD bound, um, maybe some spikes have two or three RBDs bound by ACE2 molecules. And uh, what we and others have shown is that this, when, when all three RBDs are bound and they're in the up state, the spike is really unstable. And the S1 subunit then falls off. And so S1 subunits can maybe remain bound to ACE2 or eventually diffuse. And it leaves S2 in this probably very short-lived prefusion confirmation that is actually pretty similar to how RSVF looks um, in, in general. And so in this transient, uh, exposed prefusion state then, we see the same type of interaction where the, the spike protein, the S2 subunit refolds, shoots the fusion peptide into the host cell membrane. This then begins to collapse and break down. And then we end up getting formation of the fusion pore and the highly stable post-fusion confirmation. So when we started this work in 2013, and even as late as 2016, we didn't know what a we didn't know what these spikes looked like, right? So we didn't know what their three-dimensional uh, trimeric conformation was. Uh, all that was available was crystal structures of portions of the spike proteins. Um, and so we knew that in the S1 subunit, there was an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain. Uh, crystal structures of the N-terminal domain had been solved by, by Fong Lee and others. Uh, they showed a galactin-like fold. Uh, several groups had determined structures of the S1 CTD, which is generally referred to as the receptor binding domain. Um, it, it revealed a conserved beta sheet with some of these auxiliary loops that recognize receptors. For S2, we had no idea what the prefusion state looked like. There's just some crystal structures of the two heptad repeats in their post-fusion six helix bundle. For what the whole trimeric spike looked like, there was some negative stenium of, of uh, SARS-1, SARS-CoV, uh, from Fong Lee and Stephen Harrison. So it kind of had three, three lobes sort of coming out. Um, There's some low res EM. And the spike was kind of shown as this cartoonish three lobed uh, structure. And what we wanted to do was try and get a structure of uh, a coronavirus spike so we started working on MERS because MERS was circulating and causing a really lethal disease, 35% case fatality rate. 
so we were trying to express the MERS spike protein and we just couldn't make it, uh, the ectodomain. We could make the NTD, we could make the S1 subunit, but if we tried to make the full spike, we just got like no protein. Uh, we could pull out a little bit of spike using an antibody Barney's lab had isolated. And so we could, we could make a little bit. We sent it to Andrew Ward's lab for neck dystenium and we saw these like chicken feet. Um, but then there was a ton of other junk and it just wasn't suitable for, for high res uh, uh, structural studies. Fortunately, Barney, Barney's lab was also working on uh, one of the seasonal coronaviruses, uh, HK1, which is one of the four that circulates annually and is a cause of the common cold. And fortunately, the HK1 spike was just a really well-behaved spike. Um, we didn't have to do very much to it. We could uh, leave it uh, the S1, S2 cleavage site. We could leave it as wild type and it would get processed into the S1 and S2 subunits. And it looked very nice by gel filtration. Low res uh, negative stain EM showed this trimeric arrangement. We could mutate the S1, S2 cleavage site and just get the single S0. That also looked good. And our favorite construct contained a mutation at the S1, S2 cleavage site. Uh, we put a little trimerization motif onto the C-terminus. That was just a really sharp peak. We got pretty good yields and, and the spike looked good. And this uh, allowed Andrew Ward's lab to get the first structure using cryo-EM of a human coronavirus spike in the pre-fusion confirmation. So this revealed the, the S1 subunit in blue, the S2 subunit in red or pink. The other two protomers are in gray and white. Uh, we could see the, the architecture that the N-terminal domains are localized to the periphery. And it's actually the receptor binding domains that are mediating the trimerization and stability of, of the S1 subunit. Um, it also revealed two new subdomains in the S1 subunit that hadn't been detected before. We call those um, subdomains one and subdomains two. And then all of this sat on top of the spring-loaded fusion machinery of the S2 subunit. The fusion peptide localized to the, the outside and is actually partially solvent exposed. We could see where the S2 prime cleavage site was. So this was really fantastic for understanding a lot about uh, spike structure and function. And we can also then relate it to the RSVF protein, uh, because again, the, these have a common ancestor. And what you can see is like, if we focus on the blue central helix, uh, that doesn't change much between the pre-fusion and the post-fusion state. And so RSVF also has a central helix. And then the uh, heptad, the first heptad repeat in green, yellow, orange, red, and then the fusion peptide region and adjacent region in magenta, all of that flips 180 degrees and polymerizes in the post-fusion state. And that's exactly what we saw for RSV is that the first elements of the fusion peptide flip around uh, and polymerize this alpha helix. And so now uh, we had an understanding of how the, the spike undergoes conformational change and we could apply lessons we had learned from stabilizing uh, RSVF. So what we were doing at this point was we had the structure of HKE1 and we were trying to engineer the MERS spike just because we really wanted to make MERS spike and get a structure and, and start vaccine development for MERS. Um, so we tried things like disulfide bonds and others, but that didn't really work so well because the structures of HKE1 and MERS are just too different. But one of the tricks that had worked for RSV as well as HIV and even influenza was the introduction of prolines in the hinge region between the central helix and the first part of the heptad repeat one. And so here's a gel where my postdoc, Yan Shuang Wang, was expressing variants he had made. So wild type spike, we could make uh, with just a very little amount. But if you change, uh, substituted each of these residues for proline, just a single proline substitution resulted in a large boost in expression. And our favorite one contained two adjacent prolines at these two positions. And that resulted in about a 50 fold increase in protein. And what's really exciting also is that this region is relatively highly conserved. It's one of the most conserved regions between beta coronavirus spikes. So HK1, MERS, SARS, this region has RLD, two residues, glutamate, uh, and then some additional residues that are highly conserved in the central helix. And um, we were just mutating these two residues in red to proline. And so here's another example uh, showing the, 
the increase in stability and expression for the, the two proline stabilized version of the MERS spike. So this is gel filtration from an equivalent amount of cell culture, MERS wild type spike, you could just see a tiny little peak, but the two proline spike got a huge boost in expression, really well behaved spike. Uh, when we sent the, the wild type and two proline spikes to Andrew Ward's lab for some negative stain EM analysis, it showed that the wild type spike ectodomains were a mixture of post-fusion and pre-fusion spikes. And over time, they would all adopt the post-fusion, whereas the two proline spikes were really stable, were just homogeneous pre-fusion spikes. Uh, and what was great is when we sent the two proline spikes to Barney Graham's lab, um, Kosmechia Corbett there, they immunized mice, um, 0 0.1 microgram dose with either the two proline spikes, wild type spike in blue, S1 subunit in orange, or just um, PBS. What we can see is that for um, doing mute assays against different uh, MERS CoV variants, we saw that in general, the two proline spike performed better and elicited higher neutralizing antibody titers than the, the wild type spike or S1. It's not, not night and day difference, but uh, it, it was generally on the order of, of close to tenfold. And as I mentioned, that region's really well conserved between the different beta coronaviruses. And so we could just put prolines in the same position uh, in SARS. For, so SARS, wild type. Good. Okay, so SARS wild type, we could actually make a bit more of, um, but then with the two proline substitutions, we again got a really big increase in expression. Similarly, SARS wild type, Again, this is the first SARS from 2002. That was um, you know, a mixture of post-fusion and pre-fusion, but SARS with two proline was just all pre-fusion. And we could do this for basically all the beta coronaviruses uh, in, in human HK1, OC43. We even tried it in a bat uh, coronavirus that fortunately has not yet emerged into humans, uh, but is SARS-like. And that also worked really well with the, the two proline substitution. So it felt like we had this universal method of stabilizing beta coronavirus spikes in their pre-fusion confirmation. We had all this back in like 2016 and 2017. So when the novel coronavirus emerged at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we could move really quickly and transfer all that prior knowledge uh, such that the, the novel coronavirus genome sequence was released uh, and made publicly available on January 10th. Within 10 days, the Anchuang had cloned the genes containing the, the spike with the two proline substitutions. 10 days after that, my grad student, Daniel Rapp, had purified the spike protein, uh, froze cryo-EM grids, started overnight data collection. And about 12 days after that, we had submitted a manuscript of science and bioarchive describing the structure of the proline-stabilized SARS-CoV-2 spikes. So about one month from genome sequence, published online to a determined structure and submitted manuscript. And uh, the substitutions we made for the two proline spike, we replaced um, the two residues at positions 986 and 987 with proline. We mutated the S1S2 furin cleavage site with a glycere alicere. And it worked pretty well. We just, the yields weren't as good as we had seen with SARS and MERS. We were only getting about 0.5 mg per liter. Uh, but it looked really good on gel filtration, and uh, it was good enough for us to determine the, the first cryo-EM structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And overall, it was pretty similar to what we had seen for, for SARS-1. Uh, in this case, we only saw one population of spikes, and, and that was the population that had one RBD in the up confirmation, shown in green, with the other RBDs uh, here in gray and in white, and the down confirmation, which is inaccessible to the receptor. The data set was really interesting. We could analyze it with like a 3D variability analysis and we could see that the spikes were adopting different confirmations. The RBDs were in different states of up and, and down or partially down, I guess. Um, as the RBD, as the one RBD went to a more up confirmation, the neighboring RBD and NTD would move in to fill that void. So these are really dynamic molecules. They're not just these rigid spike structures. There's a a lot of uh, dynamics with the RBDs moving and, and the rest of S1 flexing. And uh, I think it's really interesting to try to figure out what this looks like on the surface of a virus at physiological temperatures. Uh, I think some groups are starting to do those studies. 
Uh, so you know, the structural biology community has come through in a big way, I think, for SARS-CoV-2. There's over a thousand structures of coronavirus proteins that have been deposited um, in the last year or so. Uh, and so uh, our group's determined a lot of spike structures. Uh, David Beesler's group, uh, John Briggs and others have done some really beautiful cryo-ET. So we now have a really great idea. I think one of the most accurate representations of what a coronavirus virion looks like in terms of spike density, flexibility, and, and movement of the spikes. Uh, so it's been exciting to, to see the community uh, really come together and improve our knowledge of these, of these viruses. And one of the things we're, I think, most excited about, again, as Carlos mentioned, is, is the, the widespread adoption of the two proline substitution in, in different vaccines. So it's now in five um, COVID-19 vaccines, CureVac being the fifth in phase three clinical trials. Uh, so Moderna had the, their mRNA-1273 encodes for the 2P mutations in 986 and 987. Uh, Pfizer and BioNTech's vaccine uh, has the proline substitutions at 986 and 987. Johnson & Johnson did a nice study uh, for their ADD26 uh, vaccine uh, with Dan Baruch and non-human primates where they tested seven different inserts some with the two prolines, some without, uh, and the version that contained two proline substitutions plus a mutated S1S2 site uh, was, was the best in those studies. And then Novavax, we're still waiting to see the phase three data from, um, they have the recombinant protein. They also went with the mutated cleavage site and the two piece substitutions at 986 and 987. So it's been really cool to see something go from the lab uh, and actually be injected into my arm uh, a couple of weeks ago. But we weren't happy with the, the just the 2P. As, as I mentioned, the expression level wasn't as good. And we had shipped the plasmid to over 100 labs throughout the world. And people had a really hard time making enough of it. Um, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation reached out and were wondering if we could make a, a sec second generation spike that was more stable, could be expressed easier. And we thought, sure, let's give that a try. Because now we had the actual SARS-CoV-2 cryo-EM structure. Uh, so we could really precisely go in and make additional substitutions. So my postdoc and I, Ching Lin Che, uh, we went and designed about 100 single substitutions that we felt would have a beneficial effect in stabilizing S2 in the prefusion confirmation and preventing the conformational change from occurring. So those are grouped into roughly four classes, uh, including you know, two prolines work, let's add some more prolines. Um, including some that capped helices and stabilized uh, coil regions. Uh, we introduced salt bridges by uh, finding a residue like this threonine. It's normally threonine at position 961, but we substituted it to aspartate so it could form a salt bridge with an arginine and a neighboring protomer. Cavity filling substitutions, also disulfide bonds between regions that moved and didn't move. Uh, and so my group worked with two other groups here at UT. Jennifer Maynard and Ilya Finkelstein's lab uh, because they, their postdocs and grad students wanted to help in this effort. So everybody cloned like five or 10 of these 100 variants. They expressed and purified them all, characterized them. So here's looking at the expression levels. Um, this is about the top 25 or so. So the, the two proline expression, again, around one microgram per mil or so. Some of the salt bridges worked really well, getting like six fold boosts. Um, even two-fold, three-fold boost in expression were, were, were good. Uh, pro, some of the proline substitutions worked really well. Disulfide bonds in general kind of underperformed, hurt expression, but sometimes increased stability. And cavity filling substitutions, uh, we were getting 50% increases, two-fold increases. Uh, so those were, those were pretty good. So I mentioned all of them were purified to homogeneity, um, you know, some fraction, of the substitutions killed spike protein expression for reasons we don't understand. Uh, but you know, at the 25 or so, we could put them on gel filtration, uh, assess how they look. The prolines looked really good. So the 2P variant, um, again, is down here. But many of the prolines led to increases in expression without a shift in retention volume. We didn't know whether we were producing junk or not because we didn't have good antibodies to recognize the, the prefusion form of the spike because most of the antibodies are just against the RBD. Uh, so for all of these, we had to look at them by negative CNEM and make sure that they were pre-fusion spikes. We then had these top 25 spike, uh, 25 substitutions. And so we had to try to combine them. And uh, we did some different strategies, like put all the salt bridges together, put all the prolines together, 
I would do some mix and match to kind of create a Frankenstein spike with the best of each category. And it turned out that we were able to hit our goal of achieving a tenfold boost in expression and increased stability just by combining all the prolines. Um, and so you can kind of do this forever, make, you know, there's an infinite number of permutations, but we had to just set a goal and, and try and get it out there to, to, to help everybody uh, make spike protein. And, and so we can see that the two proline spike is shown here. Um, combo 14 and 45 had two additional prolines on top of the original two. Uh, that led to a boost in expression. Combo 47 was even better. That contains four additional prolines. Gel filtration for combo 47 looked look really great compared to the original 2P. Um, based on differential scanning polarimetry, we were able to get a shift in melting temperature of about five degrees. And it just looked great by, by EM, like negative CN EM was all pre-fusion spikes. Um, so this contained, combo 47 contains two original prolines plus four new ones. We called it Hexapro. Hexapro expressed really well. Um, well above the, the tenfold limit when we scaled up to large scale. Uh, so we could start, you know, we'd get 11 mix per liter, sometimes 15 mix per liter. Uh, with XP Cho cells, we could get 30 mix per liter, 40 mix per liter. We get a big improvement over the two proline variant. Look at large scale, look great on negative stanium. Um, affinity to ACE2 was essentially the same between the two proline and hexapro. Uh, which is what we'd expect because the RBD is located far away from any of these prolines. Uh, we wanted to qualitatively assess stability. Um, we were looking at uh, ability to survive freeze thaws. So the, the two proline spike versus hexapro could both survive one freeze thaw. Uh, but after three freeze thaws, the two proline spike was kind of just a mess and was aggregating uh, or falling apart. Whereas we saw about 80% of the spikes in the prefusion state for hexapro. We also let Hexapro sit at room temperature for days and it looked fantastic, um, whereas 2-proline didn't, didn't like that as much. We could also heat treat at 50, 55 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, and we still got a lot of really nice prefusion spikes for Hexapro, uh, whereas for 2-proline at 50 degrees, we start seeing a lot of background in these smaller particles as, as the S um, subunits dissociated. We wanted to make sure that the introduced prolines didn't alter the structure substantially. So uh, Daniel in my lab determined a high-risk cryo-EM structure. Um, and so you can see hexapro in green versus 2P in white. They're essentially all superimposable. Um, this is all the S2 subunit. The density was really nice. We could see the, the density for the prolines. Uh, so the maps were really great. The prolines were in the position we had designed them in. We wanted to make sure that we hadn't altered the antibody reactivity of the spikes for groups that wanted to use it for antibody isolation or uh, serological studies. Uh, so we worked with Greg e. Polito and Jason LeBinder here at UT who had patient sera um, from four different COVID-19 patients. So they did ELISAs coded uh, and with plates coded with either Hexapro or S2P. And so for each of the, the patient sera and the different colors, um, Hexapro and S2P curves were essentially identical. Uh, so that was really promising. Um, this is some unpublished data. Hopefully it gets published soon. Uh, we sent the wild, we spent the, the two proline spike and Hexapro spikes to Barney Graham's lab and uh, Olu Aviona and Kismekia immunized mice. So this was Balpsy mice, 10 per group, uh, immunized them at week zero and week three with a terminal bleed at week six. And so there's three different doses being tested, a 0 0.4 microgram, two microgram, and 10 microgram dose. And at each dose, Hexapro elicited higher neutralizing antibody titers. And it was more significant at the lower doses. So at the 0 0.4 microgram dose, the purified 2P protein didn't elicit much of an immune response, whereas Hexapro was still really quite good over a tenfold uh, increase in new titer. And we see a dose response for the, the two proline, but not much of a dose response for, for hexapro. So we might even be able to dose that down. So we think it's potentially a really good subunit vaccine candidate. And then this is some of the, the, the last work. Um, we were put in touch with Peter Palacios' group, who was developing a Newcastle disease virus uh, vector. Uh, so that way, uh, coronavirus vaccines could be grown in eggs in low and middle income countries and could take advantage of their existing uh, influenza vaccine infrastructure. Uh, and so their, their original paper used the uh, wild type SARS-CoV-2 spike ectodomain fused to the Newcastle disease virus F-proteins transmembrane domain and cytoplasmic domain. 
Uh, and so what happens if you, if you inject this into eggs, the, the virus replicates and you end up with Newcastle disease variants um, that have COVID-2 spikes on the surface. And when they switched to our uh, Hexapro spike, they got about a three and a half fold increase in the amount of spikes per variant. And um, it, it so far looks really good. They're, they're also pulling together a manuscript uh, to, to show all of these data. Uh, but then, so these variants then that are covered in Hexapro spikes are inactivated with beta propiolactone and injected. And uh, this has been really exciting for us. So we've uh, we've licensed Hexapro to, uh, to to different countries and organizations around the world and low and middle income countries uh, royalty free. Uh, and so IVAC in Vietnam and GPO in Thailand, they've made NDV uh, Hexapro uh, vaccine completely in country uh, in their, their using their eggs, uh, not dependent on any outside uh, suppliers. And Vietnam started their clinical trial March 15th and Thailand started a week later and I think Brazil's about to start as is Mexico. We've had a lot of different countries and embassies actually reach out and want to participate in this. Um, the preclinical data looks really exciting and um, you know, hopefully I, I can share that at some point. Uh, so really, I think as long as we, we don't have any safety issues, this could be a game changer for, um, for the developing world. So uh, I'll stop there and just summarize that. Uh, hopefully I've been able to show how structural biology has made a major impact on the development of vaccines and antibodies for RSV and for SARS-CoV-2. The, the structure-based design of pre-fusion RSVF antigens has produced promising RSV vaccines that are now being tested in pivotal phase three clinical trials. Prior research on coronavirus spike structures allowed for the structure-based design of two stabilizing proline mutations that are now found in uh, four, five leading COVID-19 vaccines. And Hexapro, I think, has substantially improved, uh, has entered phase one clinical trials as part of the NDV platform. And we're talking with other companies uh, on other model vaccine modalities that could use Hexapro. Uh, in the lab, we're continuing to, to work on development of universal coronavirus vaccines. Uh, one question is, how universal can we get? Can we actually get all coronaviruses? Can we just get vaccine against all beta coronavirus? So does it have to be even more specific, like uh, Sarbicovirus, which is all the SARS-like coronaviruses? And then interested in identifying uh, non-RBD, non-NTD epitopes, uh, particularly those in S2 that might be very broadly reactive. So I want to thank uh, everybody in my lab, particularly Nian Chong and Daniel, for leading the early efforts on coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2, and then Ching Lin and Jory uh, for heading up the, the Hexapro effort, uh, Barney and Andrew, who we've worked with for a long time, it's been a, a lot of fun, Jennifer, Ilya, Greg, and Jason, and their labs uh, for contributing to the, the Hexapro development uh, funding. And with that, uh, thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions.